Welcome everybody to today's webinar titled The Next Generation of Scientists Focusing on Physical Science. Uh, typically how I like to start my webinars is just to kind of run a poll to see who's on here, whether you're elementary focus, whether you're middle school focus. So before I get started with my presentation, I know I'm gonna run this poll very shortly here. Um, you should see something on your screen right now and that's okay. Uh, make sure to uh, make sure to run that poll real quick. And then while that's happening, I'm gonna actually run my presentation next. So let's get physical with physical science. Just to start off with the agenda, I like to kind of run this real quick so you kind of have an idea of what we're gonna be doing during our webinar. Uh, the first thing I'm gonna kind of go over is creating a fair test. I like to add another little element component to any of my next generation of science series. Um, just because I think it's important just to talk about what a uh, fair test is, how does that relate, et cetera. Um, and just looking at our poll right now, it looks like there's mostly middle schools on here, which is great. That's fine. I, I can tailor this session to more of the middle school. That's, that's definitely okay. Um, but again, we're going to be starting off with showing how to actually create um, a fair test. And then we're gonna get into sharing some different resources, some projects, some different ideas, things that you can utilize, whether it's elementary, whether it's middle school, this is being recorded. So um, I'm gonna have this as a recorded session. You're gonna have access to all this at the end. Um, and then we also have a wrap up Q and A. So anything that I talk about today, feel free to write in the chat. You can, I like this to be kind of interactive, just like I said, I, with the polls. Uh, but say where you're from, maybe what you're kind of interested in. If you have any kind of questions about some of the activities that I'm kind of going over today, feel free to add those all in the chat box. All right. So what makes a fair test? As a lot of you've probably done before, basically you're changing one factor at a time while keeping all the other conditions the same, right? So that's how you create a fair test. You're testing one factor and you're modifying that factor multiple times. Um, just to see if it did it improve, did it get worse? Um, did it get my results that I was thinking of? So a lot of things, fair test is really important. So when you evaluate all the factors while also using control, I like to try to avoid saying, hey, let's change one thing at a time, only because we got to get really specific and um, really concise on what we're trying to actually achieve with our students. So they got to get them familiar with vocabulary. Let's talk about a factors. Let's talk about conditionals. Um, let's talk about variables. How does that actually entail it? So when you're talking to younger students, you might talk about factors at first. You're changing one factor at a time. But when you get the middle school or higher elementary, then you start to talk about variables. What does a variable really mean, right? Um, so, so oftentimes think out loud uh, strategies, group discussions around this, because I know a lot of students struggle with this area. Um, I've been on the science fair um, committee before I've actually graded projects. And one of the biggest things that they struggle with is talking about um, identifying those variables, whether it's an independent, whether it's dependent, usually control is pretty consistent. Um, it's just those independent dependent variables are kind of difficult for them to sometimes grasp and understand that. So think out loud strategies, group discussions definitely help out with this. Uh, an example um, maybe that you can utilize in your class, especially at the early on or even at the middle school level example is, hey, what makes plants grow, right? So let's make a list of all the things needed uh, with your group. So you can work in pairs, you can work in groups of three or four, and then you kind of come to class, come together as a class and then have a conversation about this. So there's this, now here's a website. If you want to utilize this, I think they do a good job of kind of explaining everything or most things that plants need. Uh, it, it's actually pretty technical if you want to get very consistent with it. So for example, do plants need soil to grow? Well, technically no, but they need all the necessities from a soil. Like, hey, they need to support, right, for the root systems. They need space to be able to grow. They need some of the nutrients from the soil, uh, but they technically don't need soil. So that kind of question in itself can be kind of confusing to students. So understanding all the different factors that can help a plant grow at the elementary age, you might start an introduction to that, but reintroduce it at the middle school level. And then you can actually start getting into more of those specifics of the independent and the dependent variables. So another thing too, can plants use other sources than the sun for light, right? Do they always have to use the sun? A lot of times, especially at the elementary level, they think, oh, they just need sunlight, right? Well, no, there's artificial lights. Um, again, it's the same thing with the soil circumstance where they don't need necessarily soil, but they need the necessities that come from soil. 
Same thing with the sunlight. As long as they get that, then they can have go through the process of photosynthesis. So talk about independent and dependent variables, plus obviously your control. Your independent variable is something you can change or control in your experiment. Oftentimes, I like to refer to this as your inputs. Um, and it's just, as you kind of talk about the different inputs, the outputs um, that you would get from a dependent variable, um, it, it sometimes can be confusing for students. So when I'm talking about this, oftentimes I'll say, to say, okay, if I'm trying to, you know, measure per second, the distance and I'm walking as I'm walking. All right. I, that's something that, you know, I, I can actually measure, I can measure that distance, but my independent variable is the time, right? So talking about that time that you can actually input, um, and they're based on that distance that I have. So. And of obviously, of course, our control variable. But I just, I really wanted to kind of do this because I think it's good and important for even educators to understand this more concise basis. So I'm going to run another poll. And that poll, the first question is, when looking at velocity in terms of distance and time, what is the independent variable? All right, so that is the first question on there. And I want you to answer that question. Do you think it's time? Do you think it's distance, uh, displacement, velocity, acceleration? Um, and then the second question, of course, is, you know, where is the independent variable most commonly displayed on a graph? You know, is it the law on the X axis? Is it the Y axis? Um, maybe, you know, sometimes using the X and Y axis. So just kind of get an idea of what you kind of think out there. I think it's important to answer these questions because I think it also helps you better understand. Do I have a better understanding of what independent variable is or what a dependent variable is. Um, and this is high school related, mind you. So this is something that they would be able to utilize um, in their classroom. All right, so we're gonna wait for some, a couple more questions or a couple more people to answer those questions. All right, so it looks like we got some answers in here. So looking at the poll, um, the first question, when looking at velocity in terms of distance to time, what is the independent variable? So you're looking at potentially distance to time. Um, you know, how is that related to acceleration, et cetera? The actual answer for this is time. So this is something that they, it's again, something they might think acceleration, uh, just because if you're familiar with, you know, velocity, speed, et cetera, you think that maybe, hey, this is your independent variable. Why, why is it time? So time is something that you can actually, you know, input over a distance. Um, you know, so basically, if it was where you had a X amount of distance in place, so you had 400 meters, um, and then you had actually time, uh, how long it would take you to do that, then it would be kind of reverse, right? So your distance would become your independent variable at that point. So it's, it's kind of important to really understand when it comes to terms of distance and time, the independent variable is time. That's something that you can change um, or something that you're, you're inputting over a certain amount of distance. This is like that, my walking example. Um, you can't change um, that your, your time is going to consistently change based, uh, based on you know, uh, the distance that you're going there. Whereas the pole number two, it's actually the x-axis. Oftentimes, that's the x-axis. Generally speaking, it's this is where it's going to be. And sometimes for students, this is hard for them to understand too um, when they're looking at a graph or how do I know what to put on x-axis or y-axis. So this is also something that you want to cover as well. So now we're going to get into some of the projects. Um, but like I said, if you had struggles with a little bit of the independent or dependent variable there, or if you had comments about that, maybe you kind of look into it a little bit more to kind of help you along the way as well. All right, so links to the original source. So this is going to be focused on gravity with emphasis on forces. Uh, the first one, of course, is talking about gravity. We're going to talk about, you know, how does push and pull involve around here? Now, again, this is more of like an elementary early learning. Students sitting in a circle, they toss a beach ball around, they do some exploration there. Um, you know, hey, you know, what makes the ball come back down? What, you know, can you share some of your own experience about a falling object? There's a lot of different things that you can utilize to kind of engage those students 
with that exploration. Um, it doesn't have to necessarily be a beach ball, but this is just happens to be one different example that you can do and you can engage them further, right? So what happens to objects that fall at different heights? Where do they go? Do they ever fall up? Are any other kinds of circumstances that would change? Um, you can hand out miscellaneous objects at this point. It could be cubes, your balls or counters, anything that is small weight, um, not gonna be kind of more or less a hazard for the classroom. And then as they stand near a desk or a table, they can just gently, you know, push off an object, right? Does it fall or does it go up? You know, what, what are the different circumstances? If it was sitting on a, on a desk and it was, you know, it had the helium, obviously in a balloon, that might actually go up to the air. So that might be one example that the students might see. So then you can start having that discussion about, well, okay, what impacts gravity? So different things that you can talk about, safety background, obviously, no large hard objects. You don't want anybody getting hurt. Think about the environment, the space. Do you need to go outside? Do you need to go to the gymnasium? Other different places that you might be able to go to. Talk about class management. There's a lot of extension ideas that you can do with this. Talking about, you know, plant. Oh, <laughs> instead of plants, I meant to say planets there. Um, that's a typo. Um, and then gravity of space. Uh, what happens to astronauts in space or on the moon? So these are just different, different ideas that you can utilize doing some more research or videos that you can use um, to extend this different activity that you have there. Then we can get into parachutes, right? So we talked about gravity. Maybe the next extension to that is getting into parachutes, engineering um, some different things. So this is a STEM activity that you can utilize within your classroom. Investigation one, you know, how does the angle of the parachute frame affect the speed of descent? So this is something that you can um, go up or down depending on the technical aspects that you want to get into, but this would be the first investigation. And then the second one being, you know, how does the size of a parachute canopy affect the speed of descent as well? So students are going to look at the different angles, they're going to look at the frame itself and how that affects it, and then they're going to actually get into the actual canopy itself. Um, so great, great exercise activity that they can use preparing again fair test. What are some different factors that you're going to test first and make sure that you're actually designing a fair test as you're designing each of these. So first focusing on the size um, and then also then maybe focusing on the angles. And again, you can get very technical with this um, as far as like geometry and some of the other lengths and distances, depending on the supplies you use, whether they're rigid or if they have more supplyability to them, um, especially when it comes to the canopy. Uh, so you can use garbage bags, fabric. There's a lot of things you want to be consistent with that popsicle sticks, any of those things. Um, like I said, it just depends on what you want to design and what's going to be best glued. So if you're doing, you know, popsicle sticks together, if you're just using, you know, your regular Elmer's glue, that's probably not going to work the best. So you're going to have to reiterate your design or and use a different adhesive. Um, I sometimes use this Aline's, you know, fast grab glue. This sometimes works very well for, you know, popsicle sticks and you don't have to use a whole lot. Um, but then getting into some other considerations. So there's obviously there's a lot of videos out there to make it more interactive, um, but you again want to be consistent with ever using so if you're using Chanel stems, make sure each group is using Chanel stems and uh, using a certain distance and length um, that you have so you're actually getting those fair tests in there. Then we can also again make it more or less technical, like I was saying in the testing phase, whether or not you the engineering design process, if you want them to keep a journal so they can actually write out all their iterations before they actually build it. Um, and then when as they test it, each one, they can have a hypothesis. Hey, this is what I think is going to happen. This is the reason why. Why does the square work better than maybe a different polygon? Um, so there's a lot of different things that they can use in there. What this also segues into is things that maybe you have or have not done in the classroom before as well. So the egg drop challenge, this is something that, again, controversial sometimes as some teachers are like, wait a minute, this is not relevant. I don't like it because it doesn't have enough science applications in it. Well, I, firstly, I like it because there's a lot of real world application to it, specifically to low velocity and high velocity airdrops. Now, if you haven't heard of that before, low velocity airdrop basically means you want something to go from the sky and you want to have as minimal co compact um, impact, I should say, to the ground um, for this. So if you're creating a design, so this happens to be just a, a basic design. If we want to do a close up image real quick, um, we can kind of show you what I kind of designed here. Basically, I have a little iteration here that could hold an egg. It's got like a hollow shape on the top and the bottom. 
of here, we got some rubber bands with some um, little plastic poles in there and you can attach a parachute. So, right? so there's like these six different holes on there that you can actually attach string to. So this would be an example of maybe like an egg drop challenge that you would design. Um, and then from there, after testing all the different, you know, the canopy size, testing the angles of the parachute, you can actually see what is the best angles and design for your egg drop challenge. So again, low velocity is from a, trying to create minimal impact to the earth or the surface, whereas high velocity airdrop is an example of like a plane that flies really low to the ground and then they might drop a tank, right? And so basically the design of the parachute is to more or less stabilize it. So it's not necessary. So it's a high speed drop off. Sometimes they do this with certain cargo and other things. So there's high velocity and there's low velocity or there's like free fall airdrop, right? Where they have no parachute. Uh, but so there's there's a lot of different applications to this. And when they understand why we would do an egg drop, it's because we use this in everyday life for like airdrops, like I said. So you have to relate it. If you're just doing an egg challenge just because you're doing an egg challenge, that's one thing in STEM activity. But relating it to real world application, like the airdrops that we do in real life, that has some more applications. So now you can actually have like a target where they have to have, you know, minimal um, or maybe you're trying to have a target where you have a high velocity airdrop, right? So there's just a lot of different variations that you can do with that to make it more technical. And middle school students can do those things as well. All right, getting into the third activity. Now we're gonna talk about hacking a solar circuit. So this might be something that you might have a lot of fun with, but basically talking about sustainable renewable energy, uh, you know, making electricity more accessible worldwide. So solar is everywhere, right? So that's where we're kind of really getting into the discussion. I love this because the sun is used in many different applications, whether it's light, energy. Um, so that's why I like this challenge. I also know that solar panels are becoming more and more popular. They're used in businesses. They're used at homes. They're, there's a lot of different things and more applications because they're also becoming more um, um price uh, savvy. So there's minimal co maintenance costs on them. Um, there's just a lot of great applications to that. And sometimes you get, you know, you know, depending on the government, uh, you might get actually some kickback on some like loans or something that you're doing as well. So just a really good way to kind of introduce something that they're using in everyday life. And then also electricity is something that they're constantly using, whether at home or other devices, et cetera. This is just another form of energy, and this is a great way. Plus, you when they hear the word hack, they're like, hey, that's something cool. I want to hack something, you know, hacking, you know, the internet or something else like that. But this is hacking a solar circuit. So basically what you're doing is reverse engineering a circuit that you have from a simple device. So you would more or less find, you know, common things like a toy or gadget that has some kind of solar panel. And so you're going to actually, you know, I have listed a couple of those different examples. I have some images there, but you're going to actually tear apart some of this stuff just to get to the components aspects of this. And then you're going to utilize that. So you can use recycle goods and this pull out the components first to kind of show them what it's all about. Or you can do this live with a real working circuit, show that, hey, this mini car can actually go with using the sun's energy. Um, but then we're going to actually deconstruct this. Right. So when you're doing something like this, though, <laughs> personal protection equipment, definitely it's a must. Right. So you want to use safety glasses. You want to use some leather gloves um, when you're using this. Obviously, screwdriver set hammers, your flathead screwdrivers, things that you can actually do this with to actually deconstruct some devices. You want to make sure that if you are going to have student participation in this, that there are the safety encounters. If you are worried about that, you can certainly do that yourself. But if you are demonstrating this, um, you definitely want to keep that distance or provide those protection, um, protection equipment to your students as well. Um, or you can do a video of this at home or something and then bring it to the classroom. I think this is a great avenue. Um, but I know a lot of people have these kind of solar devices available readily. And so it's a really good way to kind of get all the different things that you need, but also trick it all, teach all the circuitry as well. So again, the goal is not to break the individual components as you work. Uh, but then this gets really heavy into the engineer design process, right? So thinking about how did somebody create a, a toy in the first place? There is an actual engineer, right? So when you break that toy apart or break any other toy part, uh, when it has music and it has sound, it has those electrical components, there's some hardware in there that you can actually see physically if you tear it apart. Now, obviously with the preschool toys, they're gonna be a little bit more robust. So I'd stay away from those. They're gonna be harder but, and probably a little bit harder to deconstruct. Um, but 
it's just another good way and activity that you can utilize this. Um, some things you have to make sure to know is have background in circuitry. Sometimes usually at the elementary, they do some simple circuits and something like that in the fourth and fifth grade. By the time they get into the middle school, you wanna make sure they still have that understanding of what is a circuit, the different elements. Like if there's a break anywhere, no matter how small, it's gonna break the circuit. Understanding the flow of electrons, how does an actual battery work? Things of that nature. You wanna start building on that foundation knowledge. And then secondly, you can also start getting into schematics, right? So if you wanna be a little bit more technical, you can actually start drawing this out instead of just taking pictures like, hey, here, take a picture of your battery, the wire, everything. Now give me the schematics of this, right? What would a resistor look like? What would an LED, what would a solar cell look like? Things of that nature. So you can actually get into that as well if you want to get a little bit more technical. Some things that you might see within some of these devices, obviously you have your batteries. That's usually additional, something you would have to purchase. You have your solar cell. Um, you have your resistors, transistors that work as more of like an amplifier and or a switch. Uh, LEDs are common in these. Um, as you can see, you have two different colored wires. Obviously, your black would be your negative. Your, your more of like your bluish purple color, however you want you see it, um, would be your positive. Um, but that's also another conversation you can have with there. So why are there two different colors, right? While, while there's a negative terminal, there's a positive terminal. And the flow of electrons go from negative to positive, right? So that you can have those conversations with them. Another thing that I like about some of these toys and gadgets is some of them come with motors. So if you're going to de-hack a solar cell or a solar circuit, you might have a motor that is from your solar cell, which is perfect, right? Because now the next phase of this is actually constructing and understanding your own device. Um, but first, after you get all your deconstruction, you can go through the schematic symbols. You can write that down. You can actually say, hey, what does this component actually do? You can add a picture of a component. So, hey, this is what my LED looks like. Well, why does an LED have two pins on it? Why is one pin shorter? Why is one side a little flat on it? Um, there's all these reasons of why um, they're designed this way. So you can kind of get into that kind of information with them. And then after they deconstruct it, then you can start talking about, hey, let's illustrate our, you know, the flow of electrons. How does that actually play a factor in this? You know, and then also understanding the flow of electricity throughout this circuit. Then you can get into building your own circuit. So we got all the components. Now let's use miscellaneous supplies, recycled goods, anything else that we could create and design and sketch and build our own simplified solar circuit. Uh, you reusing supplies is awesome. Um, sometimes, if you can't do that, say you just construct a toy and then they they're like, wait a minute, I can't use this because, you know, the LEDs busted up or, you know, you can't use it because the solar panel got cracked or for whatever reason. Um, sometimes it's nice to have a whole new set of supplies or kits readily available that you can hand out to each of the different groups. So sometimes that's a nice activity. So first you deconstruct it or demo it. Then you have the actual supplies that you hand out to your students afterwards. And then again, you can vary the level of difficulty based on what you're trying to do. Uh, so if you're just trying to, you know, build a circuit with a, a solar panel and LED, that's pretty simple, right? Now, if you're trying to actually build like maybe like a Pac-Man where it actually starts to move on a motor or there's like something else that you're trying to design with like the motor and the solar panel, LEDs, et cetera, it can get a lot more technical really quickly. So it just kind of depends on how you want to gauge it for your students. Maybe I might have a couple different ideas for generated out right away but then offer some other ideas where students can come to you and say, hey, if you have some of your own ideas, you can utilize that as well. Some assessment components, obviously journals are important for project-based learning. Uh, I, I'm a really big proponent of that. I always usually got my own journal that I already writing document everything that I have for all my experiments. Um, but then you can also write you know, their diagrams with their explanation, whether or not you wanna get in schematics. Uh, you can look at, you know, whether they work independently or in groups to create the design. Sometimes it's a little bit more challenging. So maybe at first they work in groups and then maybe in the extension product project is for them to work independently and in building their design. Make them really sure they understand the whole process. Um, and then, of course, your final image sketch of their design, of course, at the very end. I also know that extension ideas using origami uh, to build kits, sometimes using conductive tape. Um, I don't know if you've used that before, but conductive tape is a really good way to be able to use, you know, like 
those coin batteries, those three volt coin batteries with some conductive tape, maybe use some clip and some tape um, to hold the batteries down or like to fold your piece of paper over to actually make a circuit. That's a really good way to extend this. Getting into budgets, you know, hey, you have X amount of budget, right? So paper is this much, the conductive tape is this much, or your solar panels this much. You have to construct a project that's no more than $500 um, but these are the costs of all the different uh, just supplies you can buy from the shop, right? So it's no different than they would have a budget at home. They want to do a construction project, getting them used to the idea of having a budget or relating it to a real world problem. Say, hey, look, we have to build a solar panel that's going to be able to um, supply energy to X amount of houses. Maybe that's X amount of LEDs, right? So it's those different applications as well. Um, and then getting into, of course, a specific set of supplies where, you know, every student has the same set of supplies in the beginning, but the outcomes are very different based on the design process and their final solution. So a lot of great ideas and extensions you can do with that as well. Other things that resources that you can utilize, um, Science Friday is a great resource for K-12. to This offers um, a variety of different projects. I get some different ideas from there. Um, and you can modify these as needed, but it gives some engineering projects, it gives some science specific projects, just kind of some things that you can utilize. Um, I have a lot of different podcasts that I look at too and listen to. So this just happens to be another one that's kind of um, supported by students or younger children, uh, just because they ask, but why? So a lot of these questions say, but why, you know, does this happen? You know, why does or where does noodle come from or things of that nature. So it's just a great, great way for introduction. Brains on, this typically has a little bit higher end questions, even though it says one through six, but that's another great podcast that you can utilize. And then Tumble, which is science specific. Um, this is more of getting into, um, for example, there was one conversation about how one ex MBA player never thought to use math or science in their, um, in for their basketball, right? Until he learned about mechanical energy, understanding if you get lower, it's a lot harder to get pushed around, even though you're so tall, right? So just a lot of different things that you can utilize from there. So now this could be time for a wrap up Q and A session. I know I kind of went through a couple of different projects. I, unfortunately, I only had a half an hour, so I couldn't get into too many projects, but I wanted to kind of give a flush um, our examples of, you know, your elementary, early, middle level, middle school level, um, different ideas. Feel free to share at this time. Uh, just a little bit more information about myself. I'm Jordan Nelson. I'm a customer engagement manager with NASCO. I do professional development, a lot of different webinars like this next generation science series, our scientist series. Um, I'm gonna look at to see if we do have any different questions right now. Um, again, just the very basics. If you have any background information, um, that you want to kind of share with me or and or get in touch, feel free to reach out to me. I'm more than willing to have a conversation. So I'll just kind of wait a little bit for those different questions before we wrap up. So just to reiterate, this session was really just to kind of get you in touch with physical science. Um, it was meant for K to eight. If you do like this, or you want me to focus more on middle school projects, more on high school projects, or et cetera, just feel free to reach out to me. I'm more than willing. There's a survey after this to kind of fill out as well. Um, if you have any additional questions, um, feel free to, to put those in chat right now. And then also, I would like to again emphasize the whole fair testing. That's that seems to be a big, big challenge with a lot of students. So trying to allow plenty of opportunities to do so and evaluate different questions, understanding the independent versus dependent, um, providing different examples is definitely a good way to show how the fair tests. And then once they get used to that, you can actually offer, hey, check out the science fair, get, get involved with community science. There's a lot of other different applications for science as well, especially when it comes to physical science. Uh, so physical science seems to be a lot of the um, gravitational pull for a lot of the communities. So if you think like fireworks and all these other different great examples uh, that you can see like roller coasters uh, that they use. So physical science is a lot of fun, uh, but there a lot of a lot of fun activities that they have also has a science component of it. So it's just showing that real world application and getting students engaged and just turned on to science, especially at an early age. And then as they get to middle school and high school, 
then allowing bigger and bigger opportunities for them to extend their knowledge. So that's all the time we have. I don't see any questions. Uh, thank you all for joining me in this presentation. Uh, and hopefully we see you next time. Have a great day.